Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone is safe. I hope everyone is taking care of themselves. My name is Sharon Stroy, the Director of Public Engagement in the School of Public Affairs and Administration. On behalf of Dean Charles Minifield, the faculty, staff, students, and alumni of our SPA family, welcome to our series of election activities and events. This semester, we've decided that it was important for us to host a series of conversations, discussions around this unprecedented time, election 2020. It is my absolute pleasure for the two speakers who will allow us to enter into their green room <laughs> conversations. They have spent much time together having these conversations. And so I find us fortunate to be able to eavesdrop this <laughs> evening. So what I'm going to do is read their bios because I would be remiss not to acknowledge what who and who they are and what they have accomplished. And then I will turn it over to them. Please be mindful that this, this session is being recorded. You will see the two of them on the screen. Please feel free to put questions in the Q&A box or the chat box. We will give an opportunity for you to open your mic and ask questions and or ask questions during their presentation. It is my pleasure to introduce Susan Del Percio. Susan is a well-known political strategist and crisis communication consultant. She is a political analyst for MSNBC, making frequent appearances on Morning Joe and the network's various news programs and a columnist for OZY Media. With nearly 30 years of experience in the political, government, nonprofit, and private sector arenas, she is a trusted advisor, helping leaders develop and execute focused strategic communications and winning crisis management campaigns. Her unique insights on government procedure, regulatory environments, and public policy is highly sought after, especially now, with public affairs, policy, and media so thoroughly intertwined. Appointed as a special advisor to Governor Andrew Cuomo in 2014, she initiated and implemented communication strategies and advised and developed policy initiatives. Susan also served as deputy commissioner in the Giuliani administration from 95 to 2001 prior to her founding her firm in 2001. Her client list includes large and mid-sized private corporations, leading elected officials, political organizations, and candidates, as well as nonprofit organizations. Born and raised in Northeast politics, Susan received both her bachelor and master degrees from Emerson College, where she has served as a distinguished lecturer. It is my pleasure to introduce Susan Del Percio. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Our next um, speaker is Dr. Basil Simply Jr. Basil, I, I think I messed your name up. Please accept right. my apologies. It, it, it's all right. It's all right. Is right. a professor at Rutgers University, Newark, in the School of Public Affairs and Administration, one of our newest professors, and we are excited to welcome him. He lectures at Columbia's University School of International Public Affairs and Teachers College. He was most recently the Distinguished Lecturer of Politics and Public Policy at the City University of New York School of Labor and Urban Studies. He holds a PhD in Politics in Education and an MPA from Columbia University. He also received a Bachelor of Science degree from Cornell University. With over 15 years in higher education and 25 years of a career dedicated to public service, Basil regularly shares insights on electrical politics, governments, and public policy on national media outlets such as MSNBC, CNN, and Bloomberg TV. In the midst of racial unrest and a healthcare crisis brought on by the pandemic, he has become a leading voice on criminal justice reform, improved ballot access in against and against voter suppression. 
During the last few months, he has moderated and joined discussions with national civil rights leaders, members of Congress, and local advocates to educate public about opportunities to mobilize around the most pressing issues of the day. Previously, he was appointed by Governor Andrew Cuomo and former Governor David Patterson to serve as the executive director of the New York State Democratic Party, where he was the second highest ranking Democrat in the state. Recruited candidates for political office and worked closely with the Democratic National Committee to create grassroots mobilization programs and as the party surrogate during the 2016 cycle. Under his awesome leadership, Democrats flipped county legislators and countywide seats, laying the foundation for returning the state Senate to full Democratic control. In 2018, additionally flipping three congressional seats. He received awards from Governor Cuomo and New York State Comptroller Tom D. Napoli for his commitment to public service and education. Basil also served as senior aide to Hillary Rodham Clinton on her Senate staff, where he advised Senator Clinton on statewide policy and politics. <laughs> his work and collaboration has had substantial impact in the state of New York. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Bay. Basil, thank you. Sharon, thank you so very much. Um, Susan, it's good to be here with you. It's thank fantastic. you for doing this. Thank you so much for doing this. You know, um, we had, uh, I, so there are two reasons why I think it's important that we're, that we're talking today. The first is, you know, and, and I mentioned this to you earlier, some, about a year or so ago, I had taken some students uh, with me to an appearance on CNN. And um, I was on a panel with Alice Stewart, who I, who I believe you know, a uh, Republican strategist. And I remember the um, a lot of my students had said to me after meeting her and talking to her, they said, "You know, she's a she's a regular person." <laughs> and I said, "You know, yeah, Republicans are regular people. Um, at least yeah. the ones I know, they're regular people." Um, and I was really struck by how much they wanted to talk to her, how much they wanted to engage her, and just ask her questions that I guess they could never feel that they felt comfortable asking another Republican if they had actually known her. And the, another, another thing that struck me is that, you know, we were on today, earlier we were talking about this event, and, um, you know, yeah. we were thinking through, you know, what we were going to say and so on. And we wound up just staying on the phone for like an hour, just talking about stuff, right? Just talking about right. what goes on the world. So there are two things that came came to me from that perspective, from from that, those two examples. One, that yes, Republicans are regular people, and I happen to know one and can consider one a really dear friend of mine. And two, that given our friendship and our interaction over the years, we uh, it's important to know that. You know, Democrats and Republicans, assuming that that friendship and a relationship exists, we actually do think deeply and have many conversation about, uh, conversations about what's going on in the world today. Like, we actually try to educate each other about our own perspectives and how we can mm -hmm. find, find some middle ground. So I'm saying all of that to say that I've known you, we've been on television together, we've known each other for 15 years on TV for that entire time. I think that's how I first met you on New York One here, here in New York City. Um, and um, we often get paired together. I think we've been on every network together, <laughs> at least a few times, and most notably MSNBC, um, where we used to have a Saturday show. Or yeah. Sunday. We used to have a show, Saturday show segment. So I'm, I'm so glad that you're, you're, you could join today and that we can talk about what's going on. We don't get to see each other in person during, because of the pandemic. Um, so I'm glad that we can at least talk virtually with some folks listening in on the other end um, about what's going on really right now. So I, I guess, first of all, thank you. And, and thanks for doing this. And, um, you know, I, just give me a sense if you can. I, I really would love to know, you know, how we got here. What, what, you know, four years ago, you know, we were on, you know, probably CNN together talking about Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. but. You know what happened? What 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 was happening around that time? How did how did this how did we get to this place? 
Well, <laughs> I don't have an exact answer for that, but I think it has to do with something that you mentioned um, when you talk about our friendship, our relationship, professional. Um, one of the reasons we were always paired together, I think, and we work well together is we listen to mm -hmm. each other. Yeah. We process what the other person is trying to say instead of trying to score political points on TV, which is very common. From those conversations, we on air, we were able to have a lot more off the air right. and, and, right. and really be able to dig deep into some issues, whether it be on education, on rates, on taxes. I mean, it was there, we could have real conversations and break it down. And that trust that we've developed over the years led us to, to be candid. And, you know, and, did you not see that? It, is that difficult to do now in this political environment? Because I feel we're still polarized. And we don't do we do we not trust each other anymore? Well, that's Americans? where I was going to say. So, like, how did we get here? I think there's a whole host of reasons, and it didn't just start in 2016. Yeah. One of the things is our communications are so siloed. So like there are people who wake up and they get their, you know, New York Times turn on MSNBC and listen to NPR. And then there are those who get their Wall Street Journal turned on Fox News and listen to Rush Limbaugh. And like never the two shall meet, it seems like. And you don't and you don't learn a lot of other perspectives. What I think we both got a lot of credit for is I would go on MSNBC, you would go on Fox, and we would still be able to resent represent our beliefs, yeah. but not fight. And I think right. that's what where we got to is we were so polarized by 2016 as a result of a lot of things. Yeah. But it was like you couldn't listen to one side. You had to you couldn't listen to the other side. You had to disagree with the other side. And Donald Trump has now made that tenfold. I mean, I cringe when I hear him say, well, the Democrats in that way, like when they're talking about legislation. No, it's not you versus the Democrats. It's you about it's supposed to be about you making us better and having differences of opinion. And somehow in the last four years, it has become so us versus them. Um, and, and that's really difficult. So I think what how we got here was over a period of time. We can't afford another four years of this as a country because I'm afraid we'll get too cemented and cement in our ways. And that why I am with the Lincoln Project, which is a group that is supporting Joe Republicans, supporting Joe Biden, that's against Trump and Trumpism. So meaning all of those enablers in the Senate, we are calling right. out. Right. And I believe that's like a patriotic call. Like I voted today, I went, I voted, I voted for Joe Biden and I never smiled so much as when I put a that vote <laughs> because I felt like finally, like, and I'm in New York, we're in New York. So like the vote doesn't really matter so much, but I was like, I am really doing my duty today. And now I was proud yeah. about it. No, no, and, I, and that's, that's interesting because we are hearing folks like Mitt Romney say that he didn't vote for Trump. Somebody else, the some another Republican said he didn't vote for Trump. He voted for Reagan. I forget who that was. Oh, Trump. Um, was it Baker in Massachusetts or no, was it Maryland? Else. Was it? Uh, oh, it was Hogan in Maryland. It Hogan was the governor of Maryland, right? Said he had voted for <laughs> for Ronald Reagan. So that, I mean, that brings me to a, a, an, an interesting question. Like, where has the party changed? Has the Republican Party changed? And like, how much are we going? You know, there used to be this thing called the Northeast Republicans, right? Like that moderate Romney, Pataki, um, I don't know, uh, Bill Wells. The Wild, Rockefeller Republicans. The Rockefeller the Republicans. Republicans. Yeah. Like, I, you know, do we, when are we going to get back to the time when we can just argue about something like taxes, like the, reg, the, the old days, right? <laughs> when, when, do, when do we get back to that moment in time where that party comes back and we can get back to the fighting that we used to do, but it wasn't so personal, it wasn't so you know, siloed, as you say, or has that party, are we, are we gone from that? Well, if Donald Trump loses, that's the first step in returning. But what's amazing is what we call the Republican Party right now today is really the party of Trump. Mm -hmm. And it's supporting, it's all about supporting Trump. Now, it's interesting because Donald Trump has zero core convictions. <laughs> so, I am or principles. So he doesn't care about tax policy. He doesn't care about education policy. He certainly doesn't care about 225,000 people 
dying from COVID, something that we could have done a much better job on. Mm -hmm. And so to get back to the Republican Party of your, I don't think it will happen, but I do think for it to rebuild, it needs to rebuild with people of principle. Mm -hmm. And that we, sh I hope for the sake of my party, we don't see what happened in 2010 after uh, Barack Obama was um, elected president. We saw the Tea Party and the Republicans took control a little too early, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. We should have spent a few more years in the woods really getting <laughs> it together. And, and that would have helped us. And I think, honestly, we may be looking not until about 2026. I think it could take that long for a solid rebuilding. Plus, we also have to get all those Trump enablers out. Yeah, how hard is that? I mean, I remember after the Obama, what was it? The, when was the big, the big, um, um, the the autopsy to look the the retrospective. Oh look. yeah, after the, yeah after the twenty twelve election, after, after twenty twelve, which yeah. was funny because if you remember Mitt Romney, like we call him normal today and moderate, but, <laughs> but I, and I right. I always did, but I will say the Democratic Party did not necessarily view him as positively <laughs> then as they did today. But after that twenty twelve race, you're right, the autopsy, and that didn't really how it why. That didn't really amount to much. I mean, did something was like, was there yeah. a stumbling block per se, or did they it, just? It, it almost did. It was Donald Trump was a phenomenon. Yeah. He was his own like hurricane blowing in and just taking everything a tornado, just get, gathering everything in its path. And it just really blew that apart because if you remember when we look minus Donald Trump, we were looking about Jeb Bush, yeah, right, Marco right, right, Rubio, right. Um, right. Ted Cruz, definitely, yeah, more conservative. But at least like in, back then, he was in the stream of Republicanism. Right. So the party was trying to get there; they knew they had to. But somehow Donald Trump, whether it be timing, I can't, I can't tell you what, but yeah. he just he showed up and threw everything on its ear. Meanwhile, it just goes to show you that when you do have someone who doesn't know leadership, we're right back to the autopsy. We actually have more work than 2012 because of all the problems Donald Trump has caused, especially when you look at, for example, women. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, and, and just speaking of, we have a new Supreme Court justice um, as of what is it this morning or last night, uh, last night. And uh, you know, there are a lot of folks that are very upset about the speed in which that that happened, the manner in which it happened. Now, I guess if you're a conservative, you want a conservative bench, right? Like you want because of your idea of a specific ideology. But there just seems something so um, wrong about the way this happened. I, you know, especially when you look at the I Merrick Garland. It. I mean, Merrick Garland. I mean, poor Merrick Garland, man. That guy's just sitting back saying, "What happened? What happened?" Well, you see, and that is the you know there's a, there is a difference between the two the two sure. situations besides the obvious. Yeah. But if you look at um, Justice now Supreme Court Justice Barrett, she didn't get a lot of criticism for her qualifications. Mm -hmm. Yes, on her views, mm -hmm. and yes, there was disagreement, but her qualifications were really not um, questioned too <laughs> much. Um, they just were, her opinions were disagreed with. There's a big difference. What Trump did and what more I should say Mitch McConnell did was fundamentally wrong in a lot of ways, but guess what? It wasn't constitutionally wrong. Like I think the, the you know, Chuck Schumer and the Democrats started to make an argument that it's constitutional, you have to let the people vote. No, that was not the case, as a matter of fact. What happened to Merrick Garland was the true crime, in my opinion, <laughs> because I believe if the president has the right to uh, to nominate Supreme Court justices, and it doesn't be, it doesn't have a start or an end date except for the term they are in office, right. and you, I don't really blame him. And I mean, and you know, I I, I really go after him a lot. <laughs> but, <laughs> I mean, a lot. But in this particular case. Yes, Mitch McConnell, you know, Trump did what he was supposed to do. Yeah. McConnell fought and I think actually made a very big, a poor calculation thinking that, oh, a, a big confirmation hearing for a conservative justice will help the, the Republicans. It didn't because you know what? America doesn't care about that right now. America cares that there's over 8 million people who have COVID and that we're going into a second wave. 
Right. So that was the political miscalculation, I think. But I, I really, what happened to Merrick Garland was so fundamentally wrong. I can't say what happened to Justice Barrett was. But, and, but, and that's why I always say, you know, elections have consequences, right? And that's why we try to get people out. And look, I was on the line, you know, I, well, I wasn't on the line, but I was, I, was, I was looking at the lines of those early voters the other day and just had tears in my eyes because I was like, I haven't seen this. I haven't seen this in America since ever. I mean, the, the 08 Obama election came close to that. But the last time I remember seeing anything like this, or the, let me say it this way, the first time I remember seeing anything like this was 1994 in South Africa when, when Mandela was on the ballot. Wow. And you had helicopters taking a view of voters lined up for miles waiting to go vote. And I, you know, I, in, in looking at some of the images of early voting that started here in New York and in other parts of the country, and, you know, people waiting for hours, it's, it's incredible. What does that say? I mean, first of all, I think it says a lot about the enthusiasm and the intensity. Um, it also says a lot about our election infrastructure. It's just not where it should be. I mean, I think New York is the first, this is the first time we're actually engaging in early voting for president of the United yeah. States, which is just bizarre that we're here at this. And it went doing, very well, by the way. I voted over. today and I was like, wow, you guys got it's it all stuff. together. I've never said that about the Board of Elections ever. <laughs> ever. <laughs> and, and I mailed in my vote. And because I can't go on TV and say that Donald Trump is, you know, engaged in voter suppression by condemning the post office and mail voters and, and not believe in the process myself. So I did do that. I'm confident that my vote will get counted, but I did have to talk to my parents about making a plan yeah. to vote. They were like, well, I'll go on election day. And I was like, no, dad, you don't have the knees for it. I, I know that my uncle said he was going to go. He had two knee replacements. I was like, you don't definitely don't have the knees for that. So you've got to plan to vote and we've got to think through how you might do that earlier um so it is going to be uh, i hope it's not a much of a challenge i hope everybody had an easier time as as easy a time as you have but i do worry that what votes do exist for joe biden can actually get counted well i i mean i actually have a lot of faith in the system i really do i think people were working really hard and in in the get the counting is in the back office of these board of elections mm -hmm at the state level down to like the, the county level. And I do I do have faith in it. I think that we have the Democrats did a fantastic job of plan your vote, vote yeah. early. Yeah. It was great messaging. But you know, one thing that's very interesting when you talk about the lines that we saw in like 66, 62 million people have already early voted. That's great. But the one thing you, you talk about 1994 and Nelson Mandela, people were so excited to vote yeah. for him. Yeah. They wanted to vote for him. They were out there with their hearts. The difference is, is right now people are out there almost with their fists. They want to get Donald Trump out so <laughs> badly. I do not feel that people are, the numbers we're seeing are about passion for Joe Biden. I think it's for a passion for back to stability, for normalism, and that Donald Trump was, for people who thought, like, how bad could it be? It was 10 times worse. No yeah. one could imagine. Even yeah. Republicans, and I speak to a lot of them, who voted for Donald Trump in 2016, who are voting for Joe Biden in 2020. It's like they never thought it could be that bad. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting you talk about enthusiasm because there are a lot of folks that I spoke, have been speaking to lately that still feel, they still ask me questions about, you know, this Joe Biden guy. And I'm like, look, man, if you don't want to vote for Joe Biden, vote for Kamala Harris. You know, I was going to say, vote for Kamala. You know, if you don't want to vote for Joe. And I also say, look, this country has three over 330 million people. Over 300 languages are spoken. There is no way that two parties can represent all of that diversity. That's true. So we try to, and I try to tell people, look, find the party, and I hate to say it this way, but find the party that most closely matches your interests. Don't vote for the, the lesser of two evils. I never like to talk in those terms because I do think that that, that that really just causes us to think less about our overall system. And I want to be more encouraging and positive. So I say, find a party that most closely represents your interests. And one of the things that you, pro you can appreciate, particularly the older I get, I'm, part of me is, it's not just who I like, it's if I really had a problem with somebody I know is in the hospital, 
Is there someone that I could call, someone who I have access to, or someone who, you know, whose administration has set the tone that I know if I really needed something, like there are people that I know that have that person's ear that could, you know what I mean? And there are people around Joe Biden, the people around Kamala Harris that I feel like even if Joe does something that may not sit right, or Kamala says something that may not sit right, sit right, I know that the people around them, because I know them, are helping steady the ship. Now, I know that's not going to be the case for most folks, right? Because of what we do, we know these okay. intimately. Um, but I, I, that's what I try to tell folks. Like, if it's not, if you don't like the candidate, who's around them that you might like? And let's find the party and the person that closely represents your interests. I can understand that as far as affiliation with a party, but I think this, these four years have really taught us something, and that is being qualified. Yeah, yeah. man, that's... I mean, <laughs> I almost rather have, like, I am ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with you on Biden's policies come January yeah. 21st, 2021. Because we will. <laughs> because we, because we'll have disagreements. Yeah. And when I say go at you, we, we yeah, actually yeah, have very we'll... nice, civil, wonderful conversations. Of course. But we can disagree on a policy. But I need someone right now, and I think we've learned how important understanding how governance works. Yeah. I mean, this was a once in a 100 year occurrence with COVID, but we've had lots of smaller things in our in our lifetime, in our just in our lifetime alone. And I think that's really important to start thinking about who can run the country better, who is the most qualified. And I understand, especially damn ballot people tend to vote Democrat or Republican. Um, I tend to vote a little bit more of my interests, um, like. Today, I'll just say it. I voted for Carolyn Maloney only because I thought she 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 should have some heft coming from New York, given her position in Congress and what she can deliver for our state. I disagree with her tremendously on a lot of other things, but I wanted her to be able to vigorously deliver for New York, and she can only do that with a show of support. By the way, for those listening, two things. Carolyn Maloney is a long-serving Democrat in the House of Representatives who represents good chunk of the Upper West, Upper East Side. I think she's in Queens a little bit. Yeah, too. she is in Queens, absolutely, yeah. Right. Um, and I would also, yes, because of her, her challenges that they come from Queens, yes, that's right. Um, and I wanna just pause here for a second to say, if anybody has a question, feel free to put that question in the chat. Um, we'll, happy, we'll be happy to answer them, um, but uh, we'll keep going. I will, I, I think this is an interesting moment because it does speak to this the point that you made about governance. Way back when the president was being impeached, look how long ago that was. Anymore. That was like <laughs> ages ago, right? I remember we we would have these conversations all the time and be on camera. For full disclosure, Susan supported impeachment publicly before I did. And <laughs> here's what's interesting about that because I, you know, I was thinking about sort of the, some of a lot of the folks in the party, and I, you know, was still sort of coming off of my my tenure with the Democratic Party, and um, you know, a lot of the party leadership they weren't there, so I kind of didn't want to go ahead of them at that point. And I also felt like, man, you know, Nancy Pelosi's in this weird position where she needed to balance. She we had just gotten the House back. We needed to balance the need to keep her majority and, and make sure that we could do that. And so how do we how do we figure out how to hold the president accountable without taking the step? And she herself has said, you know, and said that she wasn't ready. Um, even though Jerry Mettler, who had heads judiciary, right? The judiciary, mm -hmm. judiciary. Um, who represents the other side of Manhattan, the Upper West Side in Brooklyn, um, was a little more you know, in favor of actually taking this major step. But I remember after all the times that we were on camera and sort of you saying this and me feeling like, I just don't know if we're ready. I was actually convinced by a voter. I don't know if I told, ever told you a story, mm. but I was, I was walking <laughs> near my apartment and a, a young African-American man stopped me because he recognized me. He was in a laundromat of all places. He recognized me on the street he came out of the laundromat and he said, look, man, I love watching you on TV, but I, I got to talk to you about this impeachment thing. And he just, he really started to make a case. And we sat there, we stood there for 
40 minutes, 40 minutes. I don't even remember where I was going, but we stood there for 40 minutes to just talk about this issue of impeachment. And he convinced me right in that moment that we had to go and do it. Even if the party leaders weren't there yet, I, his, his argument convinced me that we needed to, we needed to go there. And I, it was you, a, I'm just curious, was the argument because it's the right thing to do? Because you know, that's where I fell in. I was like, we just have to do it. We have to hold him accountable. It is, he should be impeached. And if we break uh -huh. norms, if we start breaking norms because he broke norms, that's wrong. That's and, I wrong. Added, and I added to that argument. But in other words, he had an argument. And then I said to him, you know what? But the truth is, and you're right, that if we don't hold this president accountable, it's unfair to the former presidents that we held to a higher standard. And it's not going to be fair. And then we're, what we're do also saying is that for future presidents, we're not going to hold you to a high standard at all. Right. <laughs> you know, so that, yes, so there was a, an issue of accountability there. But he made a very emotional argument. He said to me just that, you know, we, we, we have to do something because we just feel like we just don't have power. And if that's all we have, we've got to use it. And I remember going on TV the very next time I was on um, MSNBC, it was uh, Stephanie Rule in the morning. And I, and I said, I said, you've heard me say that I'm against it, but now I'm for it. Because particularly as a black man, I can't, ever be in a position where I have power and don't use it. I always have to use power to my power to do the things that I want to do, get to where I want to go. I don't have the luxury of having power and not using it. And I think from the perspective of a person of color, they see that. They say, they'll say they look at Pelosi and they'll look at the house and say, you have the power to do this. Why aren't you using it? And the truth is, I think in some ways that also explains to some extent that we've talked about this, like why some black men, for example, are uncertain about where they're voting this year, which is also a little troubling. But that's that that being able to have power and use it was really the argument that convinced me. By the way, this is just for the audience. This is actually how we talk in the green room. That is true. That is <laughs> we true. We actually really have these conversations <laughs> just like this because I I need to learn. We need to learn from each other and understand that because, frankly, where else am I going to get that perspective, Basil? Yeah. If I'm not talking to you, where am I going to hear that you were stopped by a young black man who offered his, you know, talked to you about impeachment, like, and then your perspective of I have to use my power. Now, it may seem obvious, but you know what? It's so powerful to hear you say it and the effects it has on me, even though, even if we're alone in a green room. <laughs> right, it's right, just, it, right. but, but that goes, and it goes back to the listening aspect yeah. and, and trying to understand and, you know, I always laugh because I know I'm not supposed to look at Twitter, but boy, like I get it coming and going because the Republicans hate me because I, I don't believe in Trump and I'm against him. And Democrats just say, you're still a Republican, so it's all your fault. And I'm like, <laughs> well, okay, I didn't know I had that much power, yeah. but but thank you, I control this country. Um, but it's it's a very hard, it's a very hard road to walk because you, you have to really have a sense of being true to yourself. And I think that's what stands out with people in our business and why some people are friends and some people last like 10 minutes in this business and never make it. It's because you have to have the courage of your convictions, even when it's uncomfortable. Right. And, and be willing to say like, like you did, like you had an issue with, you know, like when you look at leadership in the house at that time, it was you didn't want to get ahead of it. Well, sometimes you just have to. And it, have took, to. it took a person to, you know, on the street to tell you that. Yeah. But, but that's an important listen point. To it. But that's an important point too. Yeah, because it's so many, I think there's so many voters that view us. Look, even though there people have like a thousand channels, TV is still a very powerful mm -hmm. vehicle, right? And so they see folks like us and they may think of us as sort of elites and power brokers. Sometimes we don't think of ourselves that way, but I do think it's important to be <laughs> approachable. I think it's important to have those conversations on the ground because I learn so much from, from voters when I see them and they recognize me and they talk to me. And I oftentimes am in places where I don't even, if people don't recognize me, I don't talk about what I do because I want to hear from them. 
Right, and exactly. I get so much good information about what's going on in the world <laughs> and how to process that, right? And being able to process that. We, and we, we talk about these things. And I remember, um, I, I don't know if you remember this, but when I ran for office 10 years ago, I was at a fundraiser and you were there, you were in the room. I know I mean, exactly which one you're talking right? about. And I was in the back of the room. I know exactly against bookcases. I totally remember. Right. That. And then we just sat there and just talked about like what was going on and how things, you know, what was going on in the world and about the race, but also about like the policies involved because it was a lot of education related stuff. And it's, and sometimes to be honest with you, even though we, there's a perception of, of who we are and the kind of people we are, what we do, the truth is we, we're, we're, you know, we're lifelong learners. We're constantly trying to figure out like what's going on? Why is this happening? What is this dynamic? Um, there's actually a question here that I want to I want to raise because it's actually a question that comes up often. So thank you for, for raising this question. What do you tell people who are still indecisive about voting this cycle? Um, for me, I would say, look at the record. Mm. G, don't make excuses for either candidate. Look at their records. And we are at a pivotal point in our country, in our history. And who can be, who do you best think can take us through it? If you think it's just all about a lower tax rate with Donald Trump, it's 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 we're far beyond that. That's that's nothing. We need a leader right now, and we actually need. And when these two candidates are so just starkly different in their different, and I've worked for Rudy Giuliani and Andrew Cuomo, so big, <laughs> big Democrats, big personalities, and I can tell you they both knew one thing, and that's what got Rudy through 9/11, and what's gotten Governor Cuomo through COVID is they understood how government works and how to push all the levers to serve the public. So who is going to serve the public? Who has a plan? What is their national COVID recovery plan? And just the fact that one has it and one doesn't, to <laughs> me, to me, like seriously, like that's what I say. Like that's part of my argument. Just mm -hmm. look at those two things. Don't look at the personalities as much because if you're undecided, it's easy to when when I'm speaking to kind of get into the nastiness of of Trump. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't do that. I try and really play up the records. Because Trump didn't have one in 2016, he has one in 2020. Oh, here's an interesting question. Do we think, given all of the activity that we've seen over the last year at least, do we see, do we think that if Biden wins, you'll, the, the plethora of activism and advocacy will die down? Do we think that people will still hold Biden just as accountable? Thank you, Juliana, for that question. That's a good question. Yeah, and I actually want to add to that for you and throw it back to you, Basil. Is, <laughs> okay. Um, when you think about what happened with President Obama yeah. and how people had a lot more expectations and were actually not happy or thrilled and, yeah. and kind of how that kind of same perception will happen to potentially Joe Biden. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great it's a great point because look, we've I think there's always going to be, look if we reflect on what's happened, particularly after George Floyd, Beyonce Taylor. The level of anger and frustration would have been there were it not for Donald Trump, because this is just an issue that is taking place in our community and has been for, you know, as long as we've been in this country, right? So that's never going to go away. I think what's different here, uh, Juliana, to go back to your question, and I think for others, is the is that you realize how important the tone is when it's being set from the presidency, right? You, if you think about the tone that Obama set and then Donald Trump, and then and I'm going to talk specifically about Obama in a second. But if you think about Donald Trump and the tone that he set with his presidency, there was only one way he was going to go after or talk about racial unrest, which is not to, or to focus on lo the law and order aspect of it, right? The protesters rather than the police officers mm -hmm. who had his knee on the neck of Joe Floyd. And so as you hear the president talking about that, that doesn't, that is not about healing. That is not about, you mentioned earlier, you know, uh, Susan, about how leaders can use language in, in, their, in their values, bringing people together. He did not do that. No, he wanted to divide. He, he wanted to he divide. He put fuel on the fire. He, he used Wisconsin. And that's kind of to Juliana's question, like, I understand that because without a president, without someone who has such a big platform, creating 
a, a, an alternate, an alternate conversation. Right. Does right. the conversation stay elevated if the president's right. not in play and he's <laughs> trying to, or she is trying to calm things down? Now, I think you're right. And I think with Biden in office, I think, I don't, obviously, I, I do think that issues of police brutality is still going to be there. But the question is, will Biden, particularly with Kamala Harris as vice president, strike a different tone? I think he will. Will that calm, will that change our activism on the ground? It may, it may not, it won't diminish it, but it will take some, it will create a situation, I think, his presence in office where hopefully people who are active, who are engaged, who are mobilized, feel that they can at least have a conversation with someone who can affect change. That doesn't, you don't get that sense now. And I think that's contributed substantially to the anger. But now, I think there's also something else there that's interesting is when you look within the Democratic Party mm -hmm. and what can, and I'm not saying necessarily on, on social justice, but on other potential issues, is there's a much more vocal progressive movement today than there was in 2009 when President Obama was sworn in. And they are affecting a lot of where the party goes, much like the Tea Party did to yeah, the Republicans. Yeah, that's right. So I think that there will be, I think there will be a louder group within the Democratic Party that will challenge Biden a lot more. And frankly, they'll be challenging Nancy Pelosi a lot more. Oh, yeah. And I think on the state level, let me just give you a point about the state level politics. You have a lot of, and, and this is where I'll tie it into Obama a little bit. On, on the state level, you've had a lot of um, progressives in the post-Bernie era start running for state party seats. So you yes. now have Bernie supporters who are now Democratic county chairs. They were on the outside looking in saying the party wasn't being responsive. Now they are the party. So there are two things that are going to be interesting to me. One, do they maintain that level of progressive politics or do they assume the, you know, inside because they're insiders now. Right. right. So, but but that's natural, and it's it's an important pro part of the process. But it's a natural part of the process that you you push and you fight to get in, and then you're in. You're going to have as progressive as you think you are. You're going to have people on the outside saying you're part of the institution. So the challenge for them is to, because I I somehow I'm I'm the institution. I'm establishment. I'm like, how did I get to be establishment? <laughs> like I've been like, there's no way I could be establishment. You were the insurgent candidate when you ran for office. I was, but all of a sudden now I'm establishment when I'm uh, state uh, direct yeah. EV of the party, and that happens. And so I think to Susan's point, yeah, you, uh, the party has become far more progressive. They are going to hold um, Pelosi and Biden and Kamala. As in, in you know, they're going to hold them accountable. Um, and the truth is, I do think in many ways where when Obama was president, and, you know, this goes back to something we were talking about earlier, there are a lot of African-American men, I'm getting this question a lot, that either older African-American men that don't want to vote or don't think that Donald Trump is that bad, and we're just like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? <laughs> but it's interesting because they, in many ways, a lot of those same voters feel that, uh, Obama wasn't strong enough on issues of race, and they sort of feel let down by him. They are also gendered, like every other community, right? So these, as men, particularly working class African American men, are similar to working class white men in the sense of you know this this concern about their economic future. But then you add race to that, then you add discrimination, you add the historic so exclusion from labor unions. So th there's this sort of added burden that African-American men have. And, and many of them found Obama to not have been strong enough on their issues and are somewhat disappointed by that, which is an interesting dynamic. Do, do they think, even if they disagree with Trump, they like that he is... Strong man. Strong, like he just is so aggressive on, on whatever it is he's saying. Now, I, I, I can't comprehend that thought that... And well, that's a whole nother story. But no, that, yeah. that is an attractive quality, I suppose, to some, regardless of color or gender. To some, to some you see that you hear some of the same that same language in the Latino community as well. And that's, I mean, look, I live in Washington Heights, a predominantly uh, uh, Dominican uh, community, and there are a lot more truck signs than I would see any other parts of the city. Um, and, you know, to be honest, you know, Joe Biden's having a problem in the Latino community and yeah. we're going to be paying attention to that in 
um, Florida and Texas, among other states. Uh, let me get one or two questions because we're almost out of time. This goes by quick because it always okay. does. Okay. Um, um, yeah, no. If, if so, yeah. You know, Susan was referring to this is a question about when you said New York doesn't matter. It was referring to it's safe for Democrats. Oh. It's a reliably blue state. New York has only voted for a Republican president six times since the Great Depression. Take that. Florida. Um, <laughs> um, another question. Um, November 4th, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have been announced the winners of the election. That might not happen on November 4th, first of all. Um, <laughs> now what? At this point, a second wave of COVID may, may be present. Businesses are closing and unemployment continues to rise. What can we expect? So we talked a little bit about the lead up. Let me get you to respond to that question by saying, what can we, what are we looking at in terms of the lead up to the election on election day? What do you think might happen after after November 3rd? Well, I think about a month ago, three weeks ago, people were very nervous. And I heard a lot of like really insiders and people on the street saying the same thing. They didn't know what Trump would do. Like, could he start a war? Like it wasn't out of the realm of possibility. There was like, what could he do? Right. I've now changed that we're a week out thinking the most dangerous time we may have is from November 4th, 5th, 6th, or whenever it is, until Inauguration Day. Um, what will he do then? Uh, there's a possibility that he will just crawl away in a hole for, and cry and play golf and just tweet all day, um, but not pay attention. To, like, there is COVID, and no matter what the president says, we're going to still talk about it on November 4th. Yeah. Um, that's his new thing now. We're not going to talk about it after the election. We are. And I am very concerned about it. There's a glimmer, a slight glimmer of hope that maybe something could be done in a lame duck session because there's a lot of Republicans running in 2022. Yeah. And they may have to deliver something on COVID and they don't want to necessarily wait until January. So there is a possibility that, that that you could see enough Republicans and even those who lose, but are still in office, like want to do a little bit of cleanup to their reputation, like a Susan Collins. But, yeah, right. like, but, but it will be a force of the, the legislative branch, not the executive branch. And that is very scary um, to think that our executive branch will have given up on doing their job because he lost and not rep not really and and certainly there'll be no transition preparation <laughs> and so you think and and you think you're uh and tell me a little bit more about that the point about the the legislative branch i mean you think so you're saying that you think donald trump is essentially going to give up i mean do you think that's going to happen even if he wins uh that oh, if he just... wins, my guess is, and if he wins, actually the same thing could happen because he <laughs> he has, I mean, it's not like he's a Republican that believes in small C conservative po policies like spending or, you know, fiscal responsibility. He'll, right. he'll, he'll find it, they'll be like 2 billion. Let's go for 4 billion because he might as well, because he doesn't care. It right. doesn't mean he has no sense of integrity or values or what that could actually do to our country in the long term. Yeah. So he could actually seek to do that. It wouldn't surprise me for different reasons, seeing action by the legislative branch really pushing it. And the president, even if he loses, can say like, oh, I finally delivered the biggest package <laughs> ever to the American public and at least have something to ride out and then right. talk about unfortunately, once he gets, you know, out from under the covers and playing golf. So I want to, so yeah, and I think um, I, I have concerns as well about what happens after this election. Remember a couple of years ago, back when we were actually like talking to people in, 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 in person, in, in person <laughs> um, and I said, you know, I have this nervousness that like, you know, this man is trying to start a war within our country like we i just feel like very nervous about where we are as a country i've go i go through periods where i get really nervous about that um post-election not because i think trump will go out and incite anything because he but he might but because he started something with his supporters with his followers that he can't now undo and they are now just you know and i and i get really nervous about that so even he would never strike more 
to me, he would never strike more conciliatory tones. No. But I wonder, even if he stayed quiet, would that silence his supporters? So I guess I'm wondering, if he loses, where do all those people go? <laughs> you know? Well, at first, it depends on the margin. Yeah. You know, I, I was doing getting ready for another panel I'm doing on Monday, and that one of the questions we were going to put out to the crowd was, when do you think we'll have the election results? Yeah. And I said, all right, let's do election night, the Friday <laughs> following, the Friday after that, or Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. a lot depends. Like, if if some of the polling's right, if some of the, the things that we're looking at, we could, for example, if Georgia goes Biden, we can pretty feel feel that there's a wave going on. Right, that's right. And uh, Ohio, Texas goes. Yeah, you know, I mean, we say. don't necessarily need to yeah. worry about Florida and Pennsylvania, there could be enough big states that go. <laughs> what happened? I mean, uh, the, the one saving grace about Donald Trump trying to plot some kind of civil war to, to is that he's not that smart. <laughs> he might not be. So I don't know what he could actually kind of contrive. He can tweet out to them, but he's not that smart. So he's going to what say, like, have a fire sale on MAGA hats. I mean, like, <laughs> that's what he's going to try and do. He will feel that he was cheated, but I don't, I think he's going to be mad if you listen to his speeches at some of his people, at his own people for not voting for him or not right. getting more people. He keeps right. going around, why am I in Erie, Pennsylvania? I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. Right. 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 You're here to get my vote, right? Like, right. <laughs> but like, right. I'm not coming back to, you know, Wisconsin if you don't vote for me. I'm sure right. people are saying, great, bye. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I do think that there is that aspect of him just being angry at people. I don't know. I, like I said, I don't think he's smart enough to come up with a thread that mm -hmm. would organize because mm -hmm. he's never he's never organized anybody. He's, he really hasn't. That's true. That's very true. Now, in the time remaining, Susan, I just I got three questions. I'm like, I'm like, what's the guy? What's the guy on um, Actor Studio? Oh, what's his oh, name? Yeah. I, uh, want, I'm going to be, I want to be that guy. I want to be that guy. I'm going to ask you three <laughs> questions. All right. So what what are you reading these days? I just started Dan Abrams uh, Lincoln's Last Trial, which is based on a letter that was or, or several lovers letters that were recovered in an attic that in, like a couple of years ago that revealed what was going on during before Lincoln was president, his last trial. And it's his handwritten notes. It's it's it. I've heard really good things. I like Dan Abrams. I want nothing. To, I don't like to read anything about what I do. <laughs> <laughs> I what, because like for fun. <laughs> right, right. Now, what are you? You're right. You write for Ozzy, right? What are you writing? I write for Ozzy and for NBC Think. Yeah. Um, so what I'm writing right now is I'm trying to do something a little longer of where the Republican Party will go. Mm. Um, where is my place in the Republican Party? Like, how does this work? But I'm also, which you would never guess, Basil, uh, okay. I am trying to write a children's book. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. That's exciting. That's yeah, exciting. Uh, on how, and it's kind of through my sister's dog's eyes, Uncle Murray, and adapting to- Wait, this, the, the dog is named Uncle Murray? Yeah, the dog's named nice. Uncle Murray. He's nice. fantastic. And nice. it's kind of how he has, what he's gone through and the importance of adapting including mm -hmm. having to have his front leg amputated. So oh, wow. I think that it's it's there's a story to be told there that's really important because children are going through so much adaptation right now and understanding that. So yeah, I'm trying to do that too. Well, I, I, speaking of it, and I just have to say this quickly, when I was on MSNBC the other day on the Cole show, we were talking about the Lincoln Project and on with the fathers, the, the relationship. Yeah, fa yeah. And we just talked about that sort of toxic masculinity that's kind of that comes out of the White House by Trump right now. And and Charlie Sykes was talking about like just how difficult it is to raise boys today, like just to raise sons and what that means and having to talk to them about what they're seeing. I mean, it's difficult. So I guess that so I, that book is right on time, as they say. It's right on time. We'll see. Uncle Maybe. Murray, uh, uh, look out for it. Uncle Murray's, <laughs> you know, big trip. Um, how can we find you, Susan? What are your social media handles? All right. So um, I, I'm not a big social media person, but I am on Twitter. You are on Twitter. That's, <laughs> That's true. My one, my one outlet, and it's Del Percio S. Del Percio S. 
So listen, I'll just say very quickly, um, I, I highly encourage everybody if they haven't made a plan to vote to make a plan to make vote. Plan. I do believe that there are voter suppression and intimidation tactics of, uh, at work and afoot. So please, please, please think ahead, plan ahead. Make sure that you're doing, you're talking to your parents or your or other elders or folks who are who are infirm in your orbit to make sure that they have a plan to go out and vote. Susan, thank you so much. Thank we're you. Do this again. We're yeah. do this again. I, this was I like always great. liked having these conversations with you. We've been <laughs> doing them with your classes for years. That's yeah. true. Thank you so much, and everybody that 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 challenge that joined us today. Thank you so much for doing this and and being with us today. I thought it was a really good conversation that we had, and we hope to do more. Thank you for to Rutgers Newark and Spa and Sharon and Charles. Thank you all for for allowing us to do this. this is, again, Susan, are you on anytime soon in the next couple of days? I don't know. I know I'm on Saturday morning for sure, but that's all I know for sure. I think Friday morning I'm morning Joe. All right, well, make sure everybody goes out, find Susan on Twitter, and look out for her on, on television. She's a great, great um, uh, thought leader. Um, so, again, thank, thank you. you so much, Susan. Thank you, Take Jackson. care. All right.